Well, hello there, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show, that I want to start with a question. Listen, we all hear people talking on the interwebs about more self-love. If we only had more self-love, if we could just crack the code on more self-love, everything would be all right. All of our problems would be solved. But do you ever wonder what self-love actually is? Like, not in theory, but in real-life practice. Well, that is what I am talking about in today's video. So I'm going to be breaking down five steps to curate more actual self-love. So before we get started, if you happen to be new to this channel, please introduce yourself below because we are super friendly crew. Make sure you subscribe, hit the bell so that you get notified every time I do something new because I roll out new videos twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I don't want you to miss a thing. If you don't know me, my name is Terry Cole. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, a relationship expert, and the author of Boundary Boss, which you can get at boundarybossbook.com. I also love to highlight your questions and comments. You know how much I appreciate it. I read them all myself. So from Lynette Filton Davies, on the episode that is called Understanding What Really Matters with Dr. Perpetua Neo, she said, very enlightening and relevant. I'm gonna try the three breaths resetting technique before making any decisions. Thank you for this tool and for sharing your insights. Well, thank you, Lynette. I thought that was a beautiful interview with Dr. Neo as well. So if you guys haven't seen it, you might want to watch it. It's right here on this channel. All right, let's move into today's episode. As I was thinking about this whole thing about self-love and thinking about my own path in life, going from being more of a people pleaser and moving into really actually caring about how I feel and pleasing myself. And of course, that took a long time and lots of therapy. But I was trying to figure out what is the best way? How can we break it down? And because I always have boundaries on my mind, I thought, wow, we could actually take the five categories of boundaries and then we could break down in each one of those. What are the things that we can do that would be more self-loving than what we are doing? What do you think about that? So anyway, let's, let's see how it goes. Let's start with physical boundaries. The question is, how do you relate to your physical boundaries? How do you treat yourself physically? So physical boundaries, this is about your body. This is about your actual person. Do you have good physical boundaries? If you don't like the way someone is touching you or somebody grabbed you, do you say something or do you not? Another part of this though, is how you treat yourself when it comes to your health and well-being, right? Do you rest when you're tired? Are you cognizant of how much you know hydration you are consuming throughout the day? Are you trying to fuel yourself with healthy, nutritious foods to the best of your ability? Because I know it's not available to all the people in all the places, but to the best of your ability, are you mindful or are you very mindful of what you maybe feed your kids, but then less mindful? You're just basically eating off their plate or you don't have any kind of sacred ritual around your own eating. Because this actually can happen a lot to the moms and the dads out there where you're just trying to get it done. But in that process of just getting it done, you are really sort of self-abandoning. So if we, you do it once in a while, of course, great. But And that's not a problem, right? If it's once in a while, that's not a problem. But if it's all the time that you're just grabbing a protein bar or you're just grabbing something on the go and you don't have any sacred relationship to eating and what you're consuming, that is something that you really want to think about. And in the guide, terrycole.com forward slash guide, I'm going to give you questions in each one of these categories that will help you figure out how you're relating now, and then you're gonna have an opportunity to make a list of what could you be doing better? How do you really want to relate to yourself physically? All right, let's move into sexual boundaries. So how do you treat yourself sexually? Now there's many ways when we get to self-love and self-care, there's so many angles that we could look at this from, but you're gonna look at it from the angle that it most resonates with you. So think about sexual boundaries, meaning, do you tell the truth? If you are sexually active and have a partner or multiple partners, do you actually talk about what you like? Do you say no if something is uncomfortable or hurts you or you don't wanna do it or you don't like it? Or do you just sort of go along to get along? And that would be a lack of self-love, 
when it comes to your sexuality. And another part of this is masturbation, is being self-sexual. And I was really blown away by how many of my therapy clients who would come to me in their 20s, 30s, who had never masturbated. And as a therapist, I'm very well aware of how healthy it is to be self-sexual, especially if you're in a period of time in your life. I mean, listen, it's important any time in life, but in, in your 20s, this is a time when you're really figuring it out. Unless you had very rare parents or adults who raised you, most of us, I mean, my own personal coming into sexuality was, my mother was like, don't have sex. That uh, was pretty much it. So there was no encouragement for self-exploration. And listen, the, you know, I was raised in the 70s and the 80s. My mother was born in the late 30s. I mean, there are generational factors that impact the way the adults in our life parented us and the way adults are parenting right now when it comes to sexuality and are we encouraging it? Of course, if someone comes from a very religious background, then maybe masturbation would not seem to be okay in that culture. But from a mental health and a self-love and self-care and a psychological perspective, being self-sexual is, I think, very important and very healthy. So that's my two cents. Not that you need my permission to masturbate, but I figure I'll just give it in case you do. If you were a client, I would help you find a vibrator. I would help you explore your own sensuality, give you ideas of things that you could look at or things that you could watch or things that you might want to read that could help you have a deeper understanding of who you are. Because I also think from a psychological point of view, people are almost afraid of their own sexuality, of what it means. If you have a same-sex fantasy, does that mean that you are actually same-sex loving in life? And the answer to that is not necessarily. So there's many things that I've had young clients come in and say, oh my God, I, I think that I am gay and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think I am because I'm having same-sex fantasies. But if you go look on Google and see, is it an indication of that? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So fantasies are just that, but they're important. And if we never explore them actively, mindfully with our eyes wide open, that's something that you're really doing yourself a disservice. And I gotta say, self-sexuality and self-sensuality is absolutely a part of self-love, according to me. It's just according to me. All right, so let's move into material boundaries, which this is all about your stuff. How do you relate to your things? Think about it. How do you treat yourself materially? And again, we can go at this from two different angles because self-love has to do with caring about how you feel and what you think. And even if others won't like it. So if you are someone who wants people to take their shoes off when they come into your home. And you're too afraid to say that. Every time someone is in your home wearing their shoes from the outside, it's bothering you while you're there, while you're dealing with them. It is your home, whether it's an apartment, whether you're sharing a space with other people, whether it's an actual house, this needs to be a sacred space for you. So I go into many people's homes, one of my sisters, it's a shoes off policy. So she has a mud room. We come in, we take our shoes off and go into the house. We know this. I'm not bothered by that because you know what? It's her house. If she wants me to take my shoes off, I will. So I think that that's something that a lot of my clients would say, I don't want to seem extra. I don't want to seem like I'm high maintenance. Listen, your preferences, your limits, your desires, your deal breakers, which are your boundaries, as you know by now, they don't make you extra. They make you you, those things. So I want you to really think about it when it comes to materially. Do you lend things? Do you not? Do you not want to lend things, but you fear what other people will think if you don't, whether it's lending money, whether it's letting someone borrow your car, or your bicycle, or your computer, or your clothing, or whatever it may be. So again, we're looking at, do you relate to your material things? in a way that honors you. And if you do, that is self-loving. And if you don't, there's room for improvement 
in this area to basically curate more self-love in your life. And another thing with material boundaries, I find a lot with women in particular, is that they will forego the things that they want. It's like if you are a mom, it seems like someone else always needs something before you, right? And that in doing that, and even with my clients who were financially sound and had the money, they had a really hard time spending money on themselves if it wasn't something that was practical. And now that's not everyone. I'm, I'm just telling you what my experience has been with some of my clients, but it's, it's enough that I see it as a pattern. So I want you to think about it. Is that true for you? Are you okay to spend X amount of money on kids or spouse, partner, girlfriends, whomever, but do you find it more difficult to do it for yourself? And again, this is curating self-love. And I'm not saying go out and buy a Ferrari. I'm saying think about how you treat yourself and your desires, right? There's nothing wrong with wanting something, whatever it is that you want. And so much of the time, at least my therapy clients would feel like it's frivolous, the experience that they want to have, or they don't want to go to a nice restaurant because they feel like it's frivolous. It's, it's too much money. And hey, if that's true for you, I'm not saying everyone needs to go out and spend 500 bucks on a meal. It's not that, but it's looking at your motivation. And then how do you treat others when we're talking about the same thing like material boundaries here? All right. So moving into mentally, how do you treat yourself mentally? So this is basically about your values, your opinions, your beliefs. Do you value your own opinions, beliefs, what matters to you, do you value that? Or when you're with other people, if they're not like you, do you lose that? Do you allow other people to say things that are offensive without telling them it's offensive to you? Are you more of a chameleon in this way where if you're with people who feel a particular way, do you have a tendency to just let them think that you think the same because you don't want any conflict? And as much as yes, that's conflict avoidant, but it's also self-abandoning, which is kind of the opposite of being self-loving. So this is an area that it's really important to know what you think, to spend time understanding what you think about things, your opinions, what matters to you. Even if it is unpopular, you have a right to think what it is that you think, to have your own opinion, even if others don't agree. And I'm not saying get into like a verbal fist fight with Uncle Bob when you know you're on the other side of the spectrum politically or vaccine or whatever. I'm not saying waste your time. I'm saying what you think matters. That's really what I'm saying. And the truth is it will only matter to others if it actually matters to you. So that can curate way more self-love if you discover that what you think doesn't matter as much to you as avoiding conflict or what other people think. And then that's a place where you know you can work on it, right? You can go, okay, I'm going to put my energy to that place. Okay, let's talk about emotional. And this is a really big one when it comes to self-love. How do you treat yourself emotionally? Do you think you have a right to your feelings? Do you assert those feelings? Do you value those feelings? Do you tell other people about how you are feeling? about something. Because part of this process of being self-loving is honoring and knowing how you feel. And I should have said knowing and honoring because obviously you can't honor if you don't know. And for many, many, many people in this crew, because I've heard from zillions of you at this point, the people-pleasing aspect that many of you struggle with get in the way of having better emotional boundaries and of knowing yourself more intimately. But it's also taking the time to be honest about the way you feel and not let all of these processes be unconscious where if something happens and you feel upset about it, if you are really conflict avoidant, your mind can quickly be like, you know what, maybe you're just tired. We can make up these excuses or I don't think they meant it that way. You're taking it the wrong way right? Like we can quickly talk ourselves out of 
having a hard conversation because we feel like we don't know how to have it. And that doesn't change though how you actually feel. So I want you to be soothed, sort of, if you feel threatened by this action of knowing how you feel and then talking about how you feel with someone, that you don't need to talk to anyone about anything if you don't want to. But what I want for you is for you to actually know yourself. And the only way that happens is if you are willing to look at how you really feel about things because you have a right to the way you feel as long as you are not blaming others for the way you feel. And it is very self-loving to honor your feelings. There are so many things in my life, so many experiences I've had, especially in my marriage, where I may not even understand why the thing that Vic did or said was upsetting to me, but I still tell him because he's my person. You know, I tell this story and it's true about when we first were dating, how he would once in a while come late to pick me up from the train. And literally I'm talking about 30 seconds late where I would be, when I got off the train, I would always look over the trestle because it was like up two stories, you know, to see if he was there. And if he was there, I was so excited. And if he wasn't, for some reason, I felt super rejected, which I know that makes no sense. I'm well aware that that sounds ridiculous saying it out loud, but that's what was happening. And after a couple of times where that happened and I would be quiet in the car and just say, I just had a long day in the city or I would, he's like, is something wrong? I'd be like, no, so I'm just hungry, whatever. Like, but of course I'm being way more hostile and angry than I need to be because I'm not telling him what I'm really feeling. And then I finally just said, you know, I would really love it if you would put in an extra effort to actually be in the parking lot when my train pulls up, because I don't know why, but when you're not there, I feel like crying. And I know that makes no sense. And I'm not blaming you because you're never more than like 10 seconds late. It's not even that. But it would be so, I would feel so loved if you would really work to be there before the train pulls in. And that was almost 25 years ago. And Vic is never late to pick me up. From that point forward, there's been very, very, very few incidences. And trust me, he's picking me up all over the place, all the time. And every time he's already there, Usually at the airport, he parks the car, comes all the way into the gate, like unnecessary, but so loving and makes me feel so important and so loved. So it was a self-loving action for me to be able to tell him that thing, even though I was embarrassed to tell him that thing. And this was early on in our relationship. And yet I also didn't want to keep feeling hurt and not understanding. And to this day, I honestly don't specifically, I could never find like an original injury that mirrored why I would feel that way. It wasn't like someone left me at ballet for four hours. It wasn't that, but it doesn't matter. I don't need to justify the feeling. I can just ask to get my need met, which I did. And that is very self-loving to do. All right, so I really hope that this episode shed some light for you in these different areas of your life, how you can curate more self-love. I can't wait to hear what you do, what you discover. Don't forget that the guide that's going to help you is at terrycole.com forward slash guide. I hope you guys have an amazing week rocking self-love. And as always, take care of you.